Okay, everybody, good afternoon. Hope everybody's got a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and some Trevix to keep them sustained for the next five and a half hours of us talking to you. Um, you're very welcome uh, this afternoon um, to this event, which marks the official end of the Club Archive project. Oh, yes. Uh, a sad moment, but also a, a proud moment, I think, for everybody who's been involved in the project. Uh, so my name is Niall Kerr. I'm the Head of Heritage and Community Relations with the Nerve Centre. Um, some housekeeping before we start. Uh, we're recording today's event, and we invited we have a, an audience joining us online. And for those of you who are joining in from home or your office, just to let you know that we're recording today's event. So if you're not happy to have your camera or not happy to be recorded, you can turn your cameras off now. Uh, you've been unmuted on entry. And if you do have any questions throughout this afternoon's uh, event, please pop them into the chat and we'll try our best to answer them as we go through the event. Uh, for those of you in the room, we're not expecting any, any fire drills or anything like that. So if needed, you can follow staff who will lead us out through the doors to the site. So Collab Archive, uh, as you may or may not know, has been a project delivered in true collaborative style uh, between Nerve Centre and Crony, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, for almost the last two years. Muted myself. We wanted to hold this event today as a chance to, to mark the official end of the project, yes, but also to, to present and to share some of the project's learnings um, with others in, across the heritage and the cultural sector, both locally and across the UK. And I'm delighted, as I said before, that we have this online community joining us today. Uh, delighted to this also taking part uh, as part of Good Relations Week, organised by the Community Relations Council, which and the theme of, of, of uh, Good Relations Week this year is together, and that's very much what this project has been about, but bringing people together in the context of Peroni. So we're delighted to be able to do this event as part of that, that programme. Uh, the staff involved in delivering the project are with us today too. Uh, special mention to Laura, who's rejoined us for the day. Uh, we might not let her go, I haven't told her that yet. Uh, and to Lindsay and the youngest Clow Archive and Prony member, little three year old Nora, who is with us today too. Um, so, yeah, if anybody screams, I hope it's her, not anybody else in the room. Um, and it's really nice to see some of the project volunteers and participants with us today too. Thank you for joining us. And I'm also pleased to welcome Patricia Corbett, board member from National Water Heritage Fund, who is, is also joining us today, and to Sharon Archer, the investment manager with the Heritage Fund who has supported us through this project and made the delivery of it such a joy as always, Sharon, so thank you. Um, and basically without the support of the Heritage Fund, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here standing talking to you, we wouldn't be in the room. Uh, and it's been a joy to be able to, to use that funding to deliver this, this innovative project. And I said before, it's, it's nice to be able to, to have an online audience that we can share this learning outside of Belfast, outside of Northern Ireland, potentially with a, a wider audience, because it's not uncommon, I think, for for projects that happen here in Northern Ireland to produce some really exciting new models or innovative outputs. And we wanted to take this opportunity to reflect some of that, of what Collab Archive has meant to us as organizations who set it up, and most importantly, what it's meant to the people who've taken part and engaged with it as well. So that's really important for us. So throughout the afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll get a chance to hear from the people involved in the project and, and <clears throat> those who helped to set it, set it up and to run the project from the staff at Prony about how it's impacted here, uh, and of course from yourselves in the room about how great the project has been. And remember the funder is in the room, so we're all going to say that the project was fantastic. Uh, and plenty of questions and feedback too, please, so whether in, in the room or online, please uh, pose some questions and we'll have a conversation and hopefully be able to answer anything you might have. So first of all, what I wanted to do was to recap on, on the project as a whole and where the idea for Club Archive came from. Uh, before we hand over to, to Laura and to Grace, who are going to talk us through some of the, the specific project outputs. So what's been perhaps most interesting about this project in, and, and all of the work that ourselves and the Nerve Centre of Prone have been involved in uh, is the merging of these two seemingly disparate organisations. Prone are part of the civil service. They are the, the official archives of Northern Ireland. The Nerve Centre, we're creative media arts specialists. Uh, but we found a really common ground around how we can combine those collective forces together to do innovative projects. We've got a strong working relationship together, dating back over 10 years. 
uh, or specifically over the last 10 years, where we've collaborated on a range of projects across the decade centenaries, EU funded project making the future, uh, all of which have, have kind of grown and helped us to develop new forms of engagement and new models of engagement around how we can, you know, bring the archives, how we can plug creativity into the archives and then plug people into that on the other side and, and join the dots. And this project, um, or, or sort of those projects were really good examples of what can be achieved when those two things come together. And we know through those projects that people get really excited about Crony and, and about the collections that are here. And we're keen to access them in new ways, through new mediums. And we'll never forget, we've talked about it a few times before, through the Making the Future project in particular, seeing kids coming in here who are getting ex excited about, about paper, about collections and paper, um, and genuinely running out the place like, like they were properly uh, energized. And, and it sort of made us all realize what was possible. That was a real light bulb moment in terms of how you can engage people and then how we can plug in an external activity or creativity, whether that's filmmaking or VR, which we've done through some of those projects to kind of really bring fresh life to the archives. So the success of those projects dictated how we then move forward into a project like Collab Archive. And when the Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative was announced by the Heritage Fund, um, we saw it as an opportunity to trial some of that work and take it to the next level, essentially. And this is what we set out to do. This is what we, we said we would do as part of the project. Pull it to the side. Um, and really, it was quite an ambitious project in what it was hoping to do, notably to connect new and diverse audiences, primarily people in the large part, people who hadn't been here before and hadn't taken part or connected with, with Prony before, and with connecting them through that heritage and plugging in digital technologies that we could essentially build engaged volunteering opportunities at Prony in a way that hadn't been done before. But a big part of that was for underrepresented audiences, people who, as I mentioned, hadn't, um, who maybe hadn't traditionally engaged or even, even knew what Crony was. A big part of our work over the last couple of years, I think it's fair to say, it's about bringing more people in here to understand what Crony is and what it has. So it was very much about creating that circular economy, bringing new people to the archives, showcasing the potential of what the, the archives and the collections were and what, what's in here. And then exciting those people who would go on to share their views with more and more people. Uh, and then hopefully build that that connection, build those those uh, frameworks around getting more people involved. And then essentially those digital skills uh, opportunities around um, around what is the official archive of Northern Ireland at the end of the day. So it's a really exciting place to, to be able to try and do that, to develop a sustainable model of digital volunteering uh, that could hopefully go on to be showcased internationally. And we know from some of the conversations we've had with with other organizations and, and partners in the UK and even across Europe, that this model hasn't really been done before in this way. And we've been able to take some of those learnings and share that, which is again, part of what we wanted to do today as well. Um, and there were five specific themes, project themes, which I know Grace and Laura will talk about after uh, and go into more detail around. So the approach then for us was, was really important and it's not, I don't think it's unfair to say that the structure of the project and how we set it up has been critical to, to its success. So we needed, we realized there was time that needed to be built in to identify, identify collections, identify the materials that needed to be, to be used as part of the project, go through that whole process of digitization and clearance and rights. And Prony have been an absolute dream in terms of dedicating their own staff resource and time to making, setting the project up far beyond the, the project itself. Um, and really kind of got behind and supported the project from day one. But then the, 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 the critical thing, and again, I know uh, Laura and Grace will, will touch upon it, was, was two stages of delivery. And first of all, was a, a creative engagement phase to show, showcase the potential of what Crony has and what, what are in the archives. Um, and then putting, putting some form of creative output on that. So whether that was through filmmaking, podcasting, creating new animations, for example, bringing people in, looking at a particular collection and showing what was possible with that when you when you apply creativity. And then when people were energized and excited about those potentials, uh, offering out a more dedicated volunteering phase where those who had taken part were then empowered to go on to become these digital volunteers and go through a whole process of archiving, transcribing, metadata, uh, cataloging, really getting into the, the, the full grips of what Prony was and what it, what it has. And then more recently, thanks to additional funding from the Heritage Fund, um, 
using dedicated theme days around digitization, like uh, or or transcribe transcribathons, for example. Um, I challenge anybody to say that really fast and not, not get stuck. Um, to complete tasks in a more collaborative way. So thinking about different ways that we can bring people in here. And ultimately, what the volunteer base have achieved is, is democratizing these archives around some of the themes that we know are important to them and, and making them more culturally relevant, making them more culturally and uh, publicly accessible, which have gone on to be showcased then on the Collab Archive websites and the Brony websites and online generally. And <clears throat> when looking at this event, so I can pull that down a little bit, see if we can see some of those words. Um, you only have to look at this small selection of comments on the screen to kind of get a sense of what people have said about it. And I think ultimately that's been the most rewarding aspect of this whole project, that it has created those sustained opportunities here. It has brought new people together who have now energized and want to continue to work apparently with the archives and people who genuinely felt that they were contributing to something worthwhile. So it's a really, it is a there is really strong evidence base to back up this form of engagement in this type of work with the archives. And organizationally between the Nerve Center and Prony, it's only strengthened the commitment that we have to work together and to continue to collaborate in projects like this and to find new and engaging ways of uh, working with people from across Northern Ireland and beyond in, in kind of meaningful projects that continue to add voices to the archives because that's ultimately what we wanted to do is to bring more people in here and to empower them to have their voices heard. So that's my speed in terms of what Collab Archive is. I'm going to hand over now to, to Laura and to Grace to introduce themselves and to talk a little bit more about some of the specific project outputs. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah. So, um, Grace and I, we want to share some of the outputs that were produced by the project. Um, I was the creative engagement officer and creative producer, community engagement officer, creative producer, uh, long title uh, for the project. Basically, I was coordinating alongside everyone here in Crony. As Niall said, it was absolutely fantastic to see uh, so many of our colleagues helping us, you know, bring this project uh, to fruition and to identify the, the material we will be working with offering the support along the way and then helping from start to, to finish. Um, so yeah, so as Niall said, we started with sort of like with two phases. We ended up with almost like three because as he said, we started with the creative engagement side of things, bring them in for um, a week or for a number of weeks, um, both in person and through Zoom. We experimented with the hybrid format. One of the lessons we learned from making the future, uh, from the making the future project, was you know what works well when you do online, what what works well when you're doing person. Uh, we in each project we run a series of talks, a series of creative workshops. We uh, identified a particular collection we wanted the participants to work with, and in a way, this first creative phase offer, as Niall said, a taster. You know, this is what archives are. This is how amazing they are. So let's create something cool uh, from our engagement with the archives. And then, you know, if you want to volunteer, yes, you can continue and do that. And the volunteering phase, as I said, was the second part. It was a chance for the participants to get even closer to the material that they had worked with before during the, the creative um, phase. And, and the aim of the, the volunteer side of the project was to make a uh, number of collections here more accessible to the public, as I said, through transcribing, um, metadata, cataloging, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that it worked was, uh, we offer people, once they completed the creative engagement phase, we offer them the, the opportunity to volunteer with us. We had pre-assigned tasks that we wanted the volunteers to engage with. Uh, so for example, um, one of the projects we were looking at, uh, diaries. So the task was to transcribe a thousand pages of, of that, uh, those two diaries. And, uh, and then we split you know, the number of pages according to the number of participants that you know, put their hands up and, and wanted to volunteer um, afterward. And uh, assigned the pages, signed deadlines, and then we worked with the participants. So they had an option of doing everything um, online if they wanted to, whenever they could, uh, 
with whatever equipment they had access at home, but we also offer them the um, possibility of doing the engagement and sorry, the volunteering side of things in person as well and in the room. And that varied from group to group. Some groups, um, some individuals, they, yes, they wanted to work completely independently at home uh, within a full month. Others were happy to spread it across a number of, of, of months. Uh, and others prefer to start in person to have more of that one-to-one -one support uh, here, gain some confidence, and then they went off to work from home. So that flexibility was very important as well. Um, of course, we offer training both um, in person and then online. If they were transcribing, the team here uh, were absolutely brilliant in offering them training on how you transcribe and how do you follow the guidelines and the standards that Prony has. Um, and participants were supported along the way as well with one-to-one -one calls uh, and with you know, Zoom calls as well. And, uh, and we developed a bespoke uh, digital platform as well where, uh, so for example, if people didn't have access to Word or Excel at home, they could do everything within that platform. Um, so again, just to increase accessibility as well. So again, they were given the options because one of the things that we found in the project was that some people prefer to stick to what they're familiar with and, going to make them work faster as well so instead of trying to learn a new tool and get used to a new tool as well so again i think we're going to be talking about the lessons definitely you know giving people a choice in in working with what they feel comfortable with sometimes pushing the boundaries because sometimes they think it's going to be scary and really difficult and then they try and they say oh, actually it's not that scary it's not that difficult so again it's trying to find the balance of when you push the boundaries and when you let people work with what they feel comfortable with and, and then very quickly last year, when we were running the volunteering phase, we experimented with the hackathon uh, format, I think twice. Uh, and it worked so well that uh, whenever you got extra funding, that's what uh, Grace uh, and, and, and the team here sort of like focus on. So I'll let Grace talk a little bit more about it. So the hackathon could be like a third phase, which was like a follow on uh, model as well. So how do we recruit the people, uh, the participants? Open call, social media, anyone from anywhere could join the project, but we also worked with particular groups as well that we had either worked before uh, as part of Making the Future or new groups that we didn't have a chance to work with during Making the Future, but that we wanted to work with. Uh, so both ways. And as Nyla said, we focus on five themes. So these were the themes that we focus on. Sorry, the last one is covered. Uh, so gender and women's um, history, migration, disability, but with a focus on music, citizenship, but with a focus on asylum stories and LGBTQ plus um, history. So let's take a look at the five uh, projects. If you go to the Collab Archive website, you can actually watch five lovely um, uh, videos uh, about the project. So yeah, much better than me talking, but you can watch that um, later at home. So these were the five projects that we um, delivered, let's say in phase one and then phase two, uh, before we focus on the hackathons. Uh, so the first project, uh, we focus on Roberta Hewitt's story. Does anyone, those who didn't participate in the project, do you know who Roberta Hewitt is? Yes, the wife of John Hewitt, yes. Uh, so her story is absolutely fascinating. Myself and Ulla were talking earlier. She needs a full film, feature film made about her life. Uh, her diaries alone are absolutely amazing. Um, and, and we focus on her story. So as part of the creative side of the project, we got the participants to uh, read her diaries, uh, as I said, 1,000 pages, two diaries, 500 pages each. Uh, try to see, try to read as much as they could and try to identify things that they thought it was really interesting about her life, life story. And the outputs were uh, an animated film, which you can watch it online, about her life based on the participants' findings and also an ebook where the participants talk about, yes, their time with Roberta and the things that they found it was most um, interesting. And I think with that group, I think actually everyone went on to volunteer uh, on a transcription project. Um, so we got two of her diaries transcribed as well as a bundle of sympathy letters. And, and she also had two diaries where she um, she uh, documented the books that she was reading and she wrote sort of like her, you know, her like an analysis of the books. So all of those things are, are fully transcribed by the participants and, and also the sympathy letters um, too. And they are uh, all available online through the catalog um, here. So that was a Roberta Hewitt project. Uh, we had 13 people taking part. Um, then the next project was called Living Cross and Arriving, which we did in partnership with uh, the Mellon Center in Enoma and, and with Imagination and I, which is an ethnic minority group. Uh, we, um, 
we got the participants to engage with a collection of immigrant letters that are held here by Prony. Some of those, most of those letters have been transcribed by the Mellon Center as part of another project. Uh, so, um, so the focus here was on trying to digitize some of those letters that the participants engaged with and, and bring those transcripts into Prony's um, catalog uh, too. And the creative output was a, a podcast. So we asked the participants to go into the database with all, where all the transcripts are, see what letters they could find that you know, they found it interesting and uh, select the letter and, uh, and then um, write and record a podcast about what is it that they find so interesting about that, that letter. And it was absolutely amazing to see reflections on migration back in the 1800s and the 1900s but their experience as well, either as migrants here or people who are from here, but who lived abroad or people who are from here and the children live abroad as well, which shows that there are so many different levels of migration. Um, so yeah, so again, podcasts all available, both on the Collab Archive website, but also here uh, in, in, in Pony, uh, the catalog too. And we also got them to handwrite letters for the archives too, because digital technology is great, but there's nothing like old school technology and handwritten letters. You know so much about a person just by reading uh, and looking at their handwriting. So we got them to write letters as well about their experiences of migration or their thoughts on migration. And those letters have been digitized, transcribed, and are here as well. Um, and again, uh, they um, after the project, they had the opportunity to uh, take part in a transcription um, project of uh, four diaries and journals of people who migrated into places like um, Nigeria, um, where else? I'm trying to remember, just like it was ages ago. Nigeria, oh, um, Italy during the Second World War. Uh, and yes, and there was also a young girl who uh, traveled in the 18, 1891 around Switzerland uh, with her parents, so like a travel diary. So yeah, so those, uh, those diaries and journals have been fully transcribed as well. And, and they can be read on, on the Club Archive website, but also uh, on the catalog as well. So all those things are available. Next project was called Music Tales. We worked with a group from an IAB with a varying degrees of sight loss. Um, in May 2022, there were 10 participants uh, in that group. We had worked with some of them before as part of Making the Future. We did a filmmaking project with them, and there was huge appetite to not only come back to Prony and the Nerve Center and make more films, but also to engage with the archives in a much deeper way because we couldn't do that during COVID because we're all stuck at home. Um, so for this project, we got them to engage with the UTV archives. Uh, particularly, we looked at clips um, related to Northern Ireland's music history and participants went on a behind the scenes tour of the archives as well. And the output was a series of question and answer videos. So we got the participants to learn interviewing um, techniques but also to interview each other and ask them each other questions about music. You know, what does music mean to you? First memory of music, et cetera, et cetera, first concert. And again, everything is up on the website, on Club Archive website, but also um, here in, in Pony. Next project on the margins uh, looked at um, hospital records uh, from the asylums here. Um, I think there were five or six different asylums. We had 14 participants. And with that group, we explored, uh, initially, we we're going to explore augmented reality technology. But one of the things about digital technology is that sometimes the tool you think it's going to be a cool one to explore might not be the best. So one of the lessons we learned with that project was that, you know, what we wanted to do is very similar to the Leaving Cross and Arriving project, where we wanted them to engage with stories. We selected a number of stories from the asylum records. We got them to think about those stories and we wanted them to uh, record their, you know, the, the research they carried out about that hospital, about that patient or about that case or about the, the diagnosis that patient received and or to record that. And we created um, an exhibition where there would be a mixture of um, a book with haiku poems that the participants learn how to write about um, their, you know, experience of that patient. Uh, and thoughts on that patient, uh, but also we wanted to bring that haiku to life through digital technology. We were going to use augmented reality, but we decided to go with just, you know, just um, uh, like a virtual tour of the exhibition, something much simpler in terms of technology. Uh, I can, we can talk about it, the difference between the two, because that, that, that's getting very techy. 
but basically we wanted them to engage with asylum records you know bring their own experiences their own thoughts and, and bring those stories out to the public it's a collection that has been it's mostly closed and we looked at a period that it's open but it's it's a collection that hasn't been out there for many different reasons of course very sensitive material so it was one of those that we had to approach it with with, with care because some of the stories are very difficult to, to engage with Last project, uh, and then I'll hand it over to, to Grace, is was in the archives. This was our last one. We looked at, we worked with the LGBT um, heritage um, project with some university students. We looked at um, a selection of LGBT records, both from official and private sources. And we got the group to, um, to create zines, um, you know, documenting, okay, you looked at the past, how, you know, LGBT people have been criminalized. The different issues that they had to you know to, to encounter it's trying to trying to to what is it like for you or as an lgbtq you know person or as someone who is an ally you know what are the issues today and what issues would you like the archive you know to have here for future generations so they got to do that on the margins and in the archives we didn't have a huge amount of time for the volunteering side of things because uh, on the margins was in august and in the archives was september and we were sort of like wrapping up the project uh, before we got extra funding uh, in November. So we decided to do a more sort of like self-contained uh, type of volunteering experience, which is different from the other, um, with the other three that they had more time to help with um, transcriptions and um, closed captioning. With On The Margins uh, and in the archives, uh, with On The Margins, we just looked at transcribing just one volume rather than a series of, of volumes. Um, from, from that collection. Uh, within the, in the archives, we spent a full day here digitizing uh, some scrapbooks uh, from the Niagara collection. So, um, so across the five projects, I think the common denominator is that we focus on not only getting the participants to engage with the collections in a very creative you know, way and you know, create this really cool output, but very importantly as well, to bring new stories into the archives. These are some stories that we identified that there were some gaps in terms of how is, how is history today represented. So we used the time that we had with the participants, you know, to do that as well. So doing two things at the same time. Um, yeah, so I'll hand it over to you so you can talk more about the hackathons then. Sorry. I think Thanks, I Laura. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what we've completed so far this year on Collaborative. So yeah, based on the massive success that was Lindsay and Laura's program in 2022, um, at the start of this summer, we were granted um, a extension to the project um, that was gonna be about four months long. Um, unfortunately though, due to the time and budget restrictions, it had to be much more pared back than the 2022 project. So um, some of the creative elements had to fall away but we really wanted to keep on with the volunteer and engagement and making sure that we could invite volunteers to Prony. Um, so we invited them to Prony for a series of five different hackathon days throughout the summer. So um, this year is Prony's centenary year, if anybody didn't know, so that's 2023, 2024. And um, we wanted to make sure that that could underpin all of what we were doing with the project this year. So that's what we focused on. All of the documents that we worked with um, and all the documents that we used were all from a list of 100 staff selected documents that we've been calling the Prony 100 Treasures. Um, so you'll see plenty of those as I go through the rest of them here. So we ran five different open days at Prony throughout the summer and our first one was a digitization demo day. Um, at the start of July. And this was with my colleagues in our Reefographic studio. So they gave the volunteers an introduction to the digitization side of the archive. So uh, we opened this up to previous Collab Archive volunteers for a couple of different reasons. Um, this was mainly because the Rip Graphic Studio is very small. It can only hold about eight to 10 people. And um, we also wanted to make sure that we could get in touch with the previous volunteers to let them know that we're running another program this summer. So um, I started off that day with a bit of pagination of some documents that were selected as part of the Prony 100 documents um, list. And um, we just got to paginate and on the day, I think some people were a bit apprehensive with writing on the documents they've been told never to write on ever, but um, we soon got over that and started doing our pagination um, because things need to be paginated before they can be digitized. So then we moved around to um, the Reefographic Studio 
where my colleagues Joy and Gareth delivered a presentation to the volunteers on all things photography in the archive, just everything to do with photography. Uh, we also asked the volunteers to bring in some of their own old family photographs. Um, so things that are a bit faded or things that might have a tear through them. Um, and Gareth was able to scan those photographs and then he spent a weekend on Photoshop touching them up and restoring them to their former glory. Um, and I think a lot of the volunteers um, really enjoyed that aspect of it and some of them were really moved seeing the restored photograph. Um, I think whenever we have demo days like this, I think it's a really good idea to have some element of interaction with it so that they can bring something home with them. Um, and so it's not just, you know, your standard tour of Crony or your standard tour of the Reefographic Studio. So that led us on to our second event, which was our first Transcribathon of the summer. Um, this was during Belfast Pride Week at the end of July. Um, and this was a transcribathon of Cara Friend letters. So for anybody who's not familiar, Cara Friend is a um, LGBTQ support organization that's been on the go in Northern Ireland. I think they're celebrating their 50th anniversary next year. Um, so they've been on the go for a very long time. And we had our transcribathon, which uh, Laura alluded to earlier. Um, it's basically like a mixture between a marathon and transcription. So it's a marathon session of transcribing. Um, and it's something that it turned out a lot of the volunteers really enjoyed doing. So for this one, we had, um, this was our first event that was actually open to the general public. So how we recruited with this was just through social media and also through our different contacts. So we had some contacts in CaraFriend itself, the CaraFriend organization the LGBT History and I website and the Northern Ireland Civil Service LGBT network as well. So with reaching out to all of those people, we were able to gather 16 volunteers on the day and they helped us to transcribe uh, 290 letters from the Carafran collection. So these are all letters from all over Northern Ireland and from the 1970s and 1980s uh, from just general members of the public seeking support about um, their sexuality or their gender identity. Um, it's an incredibly important collection and it's an incredibly popular collection as well for access. Um, so it's something that we were very proud to have included on the Crony 100 Treasures list. And it's great now that it can be more accessible as well. So the plan with this now is to get um, some of the letters on the Collab Archive website. No, we're in the process, very good. So we'll have um, a couple of different ones um, there. And then we're hoping by the end of the year that we can have the transcriptions and the digital copies of the letters available through the Crony catalog as well. Okay, so moving on then, we had two other transcribathons since July. And uh, we focused again on the Crony 100 treasures documents for these ones. So um, our first one was on the 19th of August, and this was our registers transcribathon. So we focused on registers, which are incredibly name rich lists that um, family history researchers go mad over usually. So it's great to get those transcribed. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a good variety of different documents as well. So we had different things like passenger lists. We had school register, vaccination register. We had an agricultural census from Newry as well. And Nula, you had a great document. It was the Black Book of the Rebellion, which was a list from 1798 of suspected United Irishmen and notes on their appearance and where they lived and everything. It's a fantastic document. Um, and then again, on the 2nd of September, we ran another transcribathon that was just basically a variety of different documents from the Crony 100 Treasures list. Um, again, I think it's good for the volunteers to um, have a go at transcribing lots of different types of material. So for this one, we had a mixture of different things. We had a 19th century court case that was relating to a murder in Cushendall. We had some correspondence between a militant suffragette and her employers who were about to fire her for being jailed. We had um, a briefing as well for the incoming Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in 1984 which listed all of the expressions that he could and could not say in public. So that was a really interesting document. Um, again, with these ones, I think that the Cara Friend Transcribathon turned out to be much more successful. There was a more um, 
contained number of things, um, whereas for the other ones, I think it's all on my tie, all on my um, my bad, basically. Um, there was some time management issues, so we didn't get through as much as we thought, but they were still very successful, and um, we will be publishing some of the extracts from those different documents on the Collab Archive website in the near future. And again, hopefully they'll be on the Prony catalog as well by the end of the year. And that just leads us on to our very last workshop that we had. So this was our conservation workshop and it was only held last week, um, last Thursday. We had five volunteers for this one um, who got a behind the scenes look at the conservation studio here at Prony uh, with Sarah Graham, who's our head of conservation here. And um, there was a limited number of spaces for this, as I mentioned before, again, it's just due to size issues in the conservation studio. And, um, but they sold out very quickly. So it was an incredibly popular um, event that we held. So we brought the volunteers up to the conservation studio. They saw some of the documents that Sarah has been working on this year from the Prony 100 documents list. We also had, um, uh, she also showed us the register of Archbishop John Swain, who was an Archbishop of Armagh. It's a beautiful 15th century volume that's gone through centuries of different conservation work. Sarah was able to explain all of that. And we talked a bit about the virtual record treasury of Ireland as well. So it was fantastic to see. And then we took them around for a bookbinding workshop in our cataloging room. And um, the idea of this, whenever Sarah runs these bookbinding workshops, usually with staff, the idea of it is to get um, a feel for the structure of a volume. And this can help whenever um, it comes to document handling, either at Crony. So if you get out an old volume, you'll know exactly what bits are more sensitive than others. So we all came away with our own little handmade notebooks. Um, they're really lovely. I joined in on this one as well, just for fun. And um, again, it's just whenever it's um, a demonstration day like this in the conservation studio, it's always nice to have the volunteers bring something home with them. So yeah, um, that's it from us. That's an overview of our summers, my summer so far, and Laura's last year of Collab Archive. Um, I think I speak for both of us whenever I say it's been a lot of hard work, but it's been so much fun to do. And it's been a great project to work on and meeting all these like wonderful people. I can see lots of familiar faces here today as well. So that's great to hear. Um, and again, it's just a celebration of this fantastic project that's um, really impacted our volunteers. It's impacted the Nerve Centre and it's impacted Crony as well. So yeah, um, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. And to everyone at home as well. Um, I suppose, uh, and apologies, I, I'm sure I'll be covering and duplicating a bit of what Laura and Grace and Niall have already said, but I suppose that the bit I'm, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, is sort of some of the benefits that there have been to, to us organisationally and, and as our, our part within the wider public sector. Um, so I, again, I'm doing a lot of apologising here, sorry I missed the start. I'm sure Grace has told you some of this, but um, Prony uh, or the Public Record Office is the official archive for Northern Ireland um, and we have statutory responsibility for collecting, preserving and providing access to public records. We hold in excess of three million records dating from the 13th century to the present, which mainly relate to uh, the northern counties of Ireland, um, but also highlight local links worldwide. Um, they include records of government departments, courts, schools, hospitals, churches, businesses, land of the states, uh, private papers of artists, missionaries, politicians, um, and everyday individuals. Uh, and these records really document people from all walks of life, um, from the most notable in history to those most marginalised in, in society. Um, and access to public records underpins transparency in government, and it helps build an inclusive society and supports personal well-being. Um, for example, in some of the work we do across Prony, this includes providing access to conflict-related material, uh, enabling people to explore their place in the world by researching their family and local history and through programmes like Collab Archive, where diverse audiences can engage with the past in creative ways and have their voice represented in the archives as well. So 
as a public sector body, uh, PRONI works for the benefit of all citizens, um, contributing to the Northern Ireland Executive's pro, uh, commitment to deliver a long-term strategic programme for government based on a shared vision for the future, which aims to improve well-being for all and affect real and positive change uh, in, in people's lives. Programme for government is a cross-cutting model where departments work collectively uh, towards nine outcomes. And I've just highlighted what, what sort of we feel to be the most um, the most significant uh, in relation to Collab Archive, which is around creating an equal and inclusive society where everybody is valued and treated with respect, um, enjoying long, healthy and active lives uh, and, and enabling and facilitating people to reach their full potential. So Pony is part of the engaged communities group within the Department for Communities, um, which is one of those nine government departments which form the executive. Um, creative engagement programs like Collab Archive help Pony to become more accessible and inclusive, uh, a more accessible and inclusive archive, um, and have a positive impact on the well-being of participants by giving uh, that creative outlet agency over their understanding of our past and opportunities to develop transferable skills and build confidence. And I've just sort of highlighted, this is, this is the departmental strategy, which is, which is all centered around building inclusive communities, um, supporting people building communities, sharing places. Uh, and once, once the program um, feeds into quite a number of these, uh, and particularly around um, agility and innovation and, and supporting people to, to maximize their technology skills, and achieve their full potential. Quite a lot of it really works around well-being and inclusion and help helping people feel valued and helping them um, feel part of something. Uh, like when, when I do talk to the public, one of the things they always say is that we're called the public record office and the clues in the title. What we do is for everybody. We are paid by the taxpayer and we are for everybody. So part of this work really is, is to help people sort of feel part of that. Um, Many Collab Archive participants will not previously have had the chance to engage with archives or indeed potentially to volunteer. So, so projects like this are, are sort of a vital way to ensure that their stories, their perspectives, their experiences are heard not only at this point, but also preserved in the archives so that future generations can explore and understand the diverse nature of our society and communities. Um, so DFC is committed to building a society where everyone is included, respected and valued, regardless of gender, religion, sexual orientation or disability. Um, Prony's archives offer a means to explore both challenging narratives from our past and contemporary issues which impact on our communities and us as individuals today. So really, archives are repositories of stories um, through which we can explore our place in the world and relate ourselves and our lived experiences to what has gone before and using that insight to understand our present um, and shape our future. So through Collab Archive, Pony benefits from new perspectives and content developed by participants. Um, many of these stories and experience may currently un be underrepresented in the archives. I suppose there was a slide earlier which said, you know, archives are, are for everyone because they're about to everyone. And a lot of the time, what there are many reasons that people don't engage with archives, but most of them boil down to awareness and understanding and confidence. Don't really know what Prony is, don't know how it's relevant to me. And even if I did, I wouldn't know how to use it. Um, and we are a public building. Anybody can come in and use Prony. They can register for a visitor pass. It's free to access. It's free to use. Part of our core business, Prony staff help researchers on site. They respond to written inquiries and they engage with the public through a broad program of talks, exhibitions and group visits. However, there are many non-Prony users who just need a bit of extra help. They need time and support um, to build trust and to build confidence. And it's really this level of engagement is something that Pony has currently only been able to deliver through programmes like Collab Archive um, and, and other externally funded partnerships. So really part of part of the aim of Collab Archive um, was to build on, on a legacy of, of a previous programme that we've done. We know that the power of creativity in the arts to break down barriers 
Um, Crony has partnered with Creative Learning and Cultural Health Nerve Centre on various projects across many, many years. Niall and I show up at many, many things since the year dot. Um, but I suppose most significantly, uh, and I'm sure you've talked a bit about um, the three year Peace Corps funded Making the Future programme, which finished in December 2021 with Prony delivering 30 engagement programmes to over 600 individuals and producing 60 creative outputs, which are now preserved in Prony's archives, targeting non-traditional audiences, such as the LGBT plus community, ethnic minority and disabled communities. Um, it was really that success of making the future that validated an innovative delivery model, which brings together creative and digital skills with knowledge of the archives and an understanding of community engagement resulting in meaningful and lasting impact on a diverse range of participants and supporting the department's strategy in relation to both agility and innovation, as well as wellbeing and inclusion. Uh, and this was really the catalyst for Collab Archive, um, uh, delivered again with Nerve Centre and this time funded by National Lottery Heritage Fund's Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative. Um, and really in developing this bespoke engagement and digital volunteering programme, the Lab Archive has established a sustainable model for future community engagement and volunteering. So I'm sure the girls have probably talked a little bit about this, but in, in terms of the first part of the programme only, and, and not Grace is probably more up to date statistics, but um, 62 participants, 43 volunteers, age ranges from 19 years old to 65. Um, an interesting split across the community and how the community identify from a religious and political perspective. Uh, and quite interestingly for us, certainly, uh, a su substantially high um, percentage identified as non-white, which is really interesting when you compare that to, for example, the census statistics about the, the percentages as in society as a whole. And again, this comes back to the idea of inclusivity and, and openness and trying to reach out and, and engage with people who maybe would not know what Pony is, why, why we're for them. And again, we're the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. It's very easy to be seen as Belfast centric, where our offices are based here. Um, but again, programs, programs like this, and particularly the hybrid nature of programs like this, um, the ability to, to engage remotely with a mix of on-site, which, which builds that personal and interpersonal relationships, both with the people here and the organisation, but with one another across the participants who can then support and engage with one another. Um, but the hybrid nature then really helps to facilitate that broadening um, and again, from some of those directives of why we would, people may have difficulties with transport, with accessibility, uh, with financial costs of travel, this really helps illustrate how, how the programme is able to reach a broad geographic spread. And again, you're going to hear a bit more in a minute about, about impact and, and some of the participants and from some of the participants. But I think some of, some of the quotes here sort of highlight what that impact has been. Uh, people talked about being part of something important. We talked about giving voices to those not able to have one in the past uh, and that maybe wouldn't have one in the future if it wasn't for this project. Um, we talked about meeting and working with new people. They talked about how that was daunting, but how quickly felt comfortable um, and how they felt useful and part of something and they felt part of and And that was a really significant thing, I think, to come out of this, that people feel part of something that you're contributing to the legacy uh, going forward. Um, and and as, as I said, we'll, we'll hear a bit more about this feedback from, from some of the participants. But um, in terms of sort of outcomes for ourselves and in terms of working with the project, I think working, this is really illustrated that, that working smart with partners who have complementary skill sets and resources create better out quality outcomes for the audience and the participants. For example, you know, smaller organisations are usually more flexible, more agile. They can often utilise new and experimental technology and engagement models. Other partners may have established infrastructure for hosting, digitising, preserving material. Both can expose one another to new audiences. 
Um, one may have access to established sectoral networks and communications channels, whilst other might use social media and, and, and sort of rapidly evolving technologies to attract, attract a more diverse uh, engagement experience. One has made this experience using technology and creative experience engagement, whilst the other has collections in subject matter, knowledge and expertise. Uh, and in terms of the partnerships, what, what is also important that those partnerships should be equitable and mutually beneficial. Um, you know, people working towards the same goals, wanting to achieve the same things and wanting to work with those diverse audiences and, and make a real impact and a real difference in people's lives using technology and creativity and heritage and culture all brought together. So those partnerships really need to be equitable and mutually beneficial uh, and, and really good partnerships widen networks, they build capacity, they develop new skills and confidence for everybody involved. Um, combining that sort of agility and infrastructure, creativity and collections knowledge um, also improves the quality for proposals. So if you're putting in a funding bid, being able to demonstrate that you're bringing all of that together really also en enhances your chances of, of a positive response in terms of um, in terms of your bid and proposal. And, and certainly in terms of feedback, I don't know now if you've mentioned some of the feedback from our, our funders, National Lottery Heritage Fund, were extremely positive. Um, we had representatives from the, the sort of um, the whole digital innovation side from um, from England come over and explore the project. We were the only funded project in Northern Ireland under the Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative. Um, I, I think from, from, our, from our small little patch, I think we're able to really impress with the quality and the outcomes and the value that the project created. Uh, and you know, we're also invited them to talk about this project as part of National Lottery Heritage Fund's wider conversation about digitization and engagement and sort of showcase the project on, on a sort of UK and Ireland wide platform to people from some of the biggest repositories and cultural organisations across the UK and Ireland, really due to the quality of the work and the quality of the outcomes. And again, that sort of sets the scene for what we can do and, and, and sort of puts us on a pathway of, of, of having ideas for, for sort of new, new innovative projects. And, and as, I suppose, as I've mentioned, I'm sure Niall and Laura and Grace have mentioned, it really sort of it validates this model as a really positive way of working and bringing together disciplines to, to really empower participants to feel to be part of the heritage sector and sort of develop skills and, and um, in, enjoy being here. And um, I think that's really all I have to say in terms of sort of crony value. So I really apologize. I hope I haven't duplicated loads of things you, you've, you've heard already, but um, from a crony perspective, um, it's, been a really, it's been a really positive experience. So I'm going to pass it across to Grace. Uh, yeah. Please be into just saying, Bishop Corbett, uh, board member from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, to say a few words and uh, and wrap today's meeting. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. Gosh, what an afternoon of learning it's been for me. I can tell you. I'm not so delighted to be here to represent the National Lottery Heritage Fund because it really has been a showcase event. And you've celebrated the success of the online project. Attention, please. No documents will be issued after 4 15 pm. It would be appreciated if documents no longer required are returned to the issue desk as soon as possible. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Northern Ireland and um, the Fund have awarded £260 million to 1,600 projects, and we support a range of diverse projects, really large ones. Giant's Causeway, Hillsborough Castle, and small ones. And the reward we get from small projects such as Paul Barker. I think mean, you've heard some of those testimonies today. So it's really great and great to hear all about it. What our funded projects have in common is they deliver a wide range of outcomes for communities, for individuals living, working, and visiting Northern Ireland. So, you know, the impact is very far reaching. 
today's showcase to me is a great example of really tangible, valuable, long lasting outcomes. And the collaboration of the Nerve Centre and Crony has enabled over, I think it's over 50 participants and volunteers from a range of underrepresented audiences. And the opportunity you've had to explore heritage and make it digitally accessible. And in doing so, what you've done is you've enhanced the value of the archives. And from what I've just heard, you've enhanced the value of your own lives and your relationships. Um, and you've done that and you've helped engage with people who traditionally haven't engaged with archive heritage. So thank you and congratulations to all of you for what you've achieved. What's really come across today is that you've got an excellent model of what, uh, participant and volunteer development. Um, and hopefully that gets replicated going forward. And I suppose my question, and I'll, I'll leave it, I can't answer it, but I'll leave it for you, is who's going to take that forward and share that best practice and own it and make sure that it happens? Certainly we would have a role, as Sharon was saying, to play in that, but it's something for the future. It's so flexible and it's an approach that gets so many people involved and um, the, the payback to all involved has, has, I mean, I'm just delighted to hear it. So I think it's something we'll have to come back and revisit. Um, I've read some of the blogs and I've delved into the website and I've heard directly from some of what you've had to say today. And I think the pleasure and the reward that you've got from engaging with archives and getting to, to work with them in, very, in a range of very creative ways um, shows what engagement can do. And I mean, you've engaged with animation, digitization, short films, podcasts, so much, so many things. And you've given me a whole new um, language as well with hackathons. <laughs> so we're all learning. So it's clear um, how the potential of the archive was, archive was appreciated by all of the participants and by the volunteers. And I think you've just become really good ambassadors for Prony and for the Nerve Centre in what you do, which is, again, another benefit. Um, you've helped with everything from diaries and letters um, from Cara Friend Archive, as well as the immigrant letters and the asylum uh, records. I mean, I had a, a read at some of the immigrant ones and I can see how you can just get completely lost in the archive. I don't know how you concentrate on what you're doing and don't just get completely absorbed by it. So what we at the fund do is we prioritise heritage projects that promote inclusion and involve a wider range of people, encourage skills development and job creation that support wellbeing, that create better places uh, to live, work and visit and improve the resilience of organisations working in heritage. And I think you have ticked so many boxes there uh, from what you've done as participants, volunteers, what Crony have done, um, and what the Nerve Centre has done. So you've got something to be really proud of. The project has um, captured, if you like, our local memories and stories, and it will help inform our future and build community connections, ones that weren't there before, but that will grow over time. So it's been a complete joy to hear the various experiences and to see firsthand, you know, your celebration. So well done to the Nerve Centre, to Prony, to the volunteers and to the participants on behalf of the Heritage Library Fund, we wish you continuing success. Thank you. So, 